Greetings to everyone. Welcome to this ex exciting event. Food is more than just what we eat. The ways in which we produce, process, and consume food touches every aspect of life on this planet. It is the foundation of our cultures, of our economies, and our relationship with the natural world, and has the power to bring us together as families, communities, and nations. These are the introductory words to the objective set for the UN Food System Summit. In recent years, and during the preparation of the UN Food System Summit, agroecology has emerged as one of the most promising transformational solution to the problems of our food system. And now a broad coalition of action is forming and gaining momentum. Agroecology is a movement, a set of practices, but also a scientific discipline. In all these aspects, agroecology is a dynamic, inclusive, transformative power to change food systems. In 2019, the Consortium of International Agricultural Research Centers, the CGIR, and French research institution conceived a joint initiative to address critical knowledge gaps about agroecological transitions to provide evidence to underpin advocacy and inform policymakers and donors about the potential of agro agroecological approaches. They produced a call for action, a call for agricultural research organizations and researchers to play a leadership role in the global movement to bring about sustainability, health, equity, and food security transition in the agri-food system. This initiative quickly evolved into the creation of the transformative partnership platform, TPP, which was officially launched in a side event of the Committee on World Food Security last June in Rome. The TPP is open to all individuals and organizations truly sharing the same vision. In this original call and in the TPP, we recognize that there will be changes in how scientists typically work. They have to be more inclusive. They should build wider and more balanced partnerships with diverse stakeholders and better engagement in co-creation of knowledge and innovation with practitioners and stakeholders, as well as better inclusion of traditional knowledge. Researchers and research organizations need to change mindsets, culture, and methodologies. A powerful way to involve the public is to engage everyone in the citizen science. This means that anyone and everyone can collaborate in research to increase global scientific knowledge. In our case, this approach is highly relevant because agroecology is based on inclusiveness and empowerment. The TPP, supported by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, which is, wishes to launch this bold citizen science campaign to involve smaller farmers, farm workers, and food consumers in generating knowledge to accelerate and document agroecological transitions. This citizen science initiative is intended to provide evidence to support advocacy and inform policymakers and donors, but not only about the potential of agroecological approaches, but also about the quantity, the diversity, and the wealth of farmers' innovation. This is particularly important for the definition of the respective country transformation pathways and strategies as foreseen in the next steps of the Food System Summit Portfolio of Action. This initiative is not a project of the coalition, but aims at complementing the work of different initiatives and all the very important research on agroecology. In a news released two, two uh, days ago, the United Nations Special Rapporteurs on the Rights to Food, on Human Rights and the Environment, and on Extreme Poverty, said, agroecology is one of the best ways to ensure that food systems fulfill human rights and respect the planet's environment. We think that agroecology should be primarily focused because it starts with the question of power dynamics. 
this, this initiative also aims to build on this premise by democratizing involvement in science. All stakeholders should democratically decide what the focus of this citizen science initiative should be, and then engage in generating knowledge in support of agroecological transition. I remember during several meetings of the CGIR System Council, we were told that gene banks are the crown jewels of the, CDR, of the CGIR system. Scientists have collected almost 1 million crops varieties and are conserving them. But before that, millions of farmers worldwide have selected and bred these varieties. Smallholder farmers are the designer of those crown jewels. Smallholder farmers are feeding 70% of the world population. And together with consumers, they know very well, well the cultural and economic value of food and its relationship with the natural world, as it is mentioned in the objective of the summit. So let us work all together democratically creating a citizen science movement for agroecology. We will co-create, co-design today and throughout the process. The floor is yours, size this opportunity, share your inputs, ideas, suggestions and concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'm Fergus Sinclair. I'm the chief scientist at C4ICRAF and co-convener of the TPP that Michelle has just referred to. Can I have the first slide? Um, I'm just going to introduce the first se session. We have uh, three parts uh, to this. Maybe you can put it into display mode. Fantastic. So when we're talking about citizen science, there are sort of two aspects to it that are important. The extent to which science is responsive to the concerns and needs of citizens, and then the extent to which citizens are involved in actually uh, providing information that generates uh, scientific knowledge, involved in the, the co-creation of that knowledge. And that original formation of the concept of citizen science from Alan Irwin uh, uh, last century um, is, is uh, bang up to date with the way in which the European Commission um, is conceiving it now. Now, some citizen science uh, initiatives concentrate on, on one or other uh, of those two, with, I guess, a little bit more emphasis quite often on uh, the crowdsourcing of data, the collection of data. Next slide. So we're already um, in this initiative that's only been alive for, for a matter of days, um, collecting uh, um, uh, lots of examples of the way that citizen science is being applied in agroecology and related fields, from collecting and monitoring biodiversity through sharing films about agroecological practices that farmers make on their own uh, mobiles, through uh, uh, connecting buyers and, and, and sellers of products and, and connecting information um, with those uh, transactions. Next slide, please. Um, the whole concept of farmer networks. Um, next slide. And, and uh, uh, farmer field schools that have been uh, pushed by FAO, where uh, people are taking part uh, in uh, um, understanding uh, and advancing principles. Um, and then uh, we've got uh, quite a bit around rights and, and citizen science. Um, uh, and, and meeting SDG targets, including uh, around soil health. So there are lots of examples, and these are just, just a few that I'm showing here, and we will be collating these to make them easy for you to access examples. Next slide. So today, we're gonna kick off uh, by looking at um, a, a series of examples that cover different types uh, of approaches. Um, and, and then we're gonna have a critique of big data uh, and then try to sort of distill what the key issues are and then have some uh, audience interaction with all of you to, to try to see whether we can start moving towards defining uh, where this initiative should go. So with that, let me go to the first um, uh, example that's being highlighted. And each one of these is just five minutes. 
Um, so Tor, could you tell us about regreening Africa um, in, in five minutes? Thanks. Thanks, Fergus. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through um, a little bit of um, sort of the journey and some of the applications of the Regreening Africa app and uh, how we're using this um, in the context of what we call assisted crowdsourcing. And the reason we call it assisted is um, that um, there's a lot of engagement that goes into this, uh, this particular work. And so it's basically working with, with stakeholders across eight countries uh, in East and West Africa. And uh, the objective is, uh, or the reason we developed the app was that we wanted to create a set of tools to allow uh, stakeholders to basically, uh, sorry, to basically track restoration uh, at scale. So first of all, the app is available on the Google Play Store. So if you want to have a look at it, feel free, just go to the Google Play Store on your Android. If you have an iPhone, I'm sorry. Um, but just go on your Android and search for Regreening Africa and it will come up and you can install it from there. So this is, is, is available and you can use it for tracking uh, your own interventions if you want. It's open for anyone to use. So what we do in the app is we, we collect information on people's restoration activities around tree planting around farmer managed natural regeneration, which many of you know is quite common in West Africa and also in parts of East Africa. And um, on nurseries, so looking at what, what uh, seedlings are available, what species are available, where are they available, et cetera. And then there's the training or capacity development module as well. So I'm just gonna take you through a few examples, um, just sort of a quick highlight. Um, and this is just from Kenya. Uh, so in the app, we obviously can, we use it in the context of projects to look at across different countries, how many farmers are practicing, for example, tree planting or FMNR or both, as you see in that graph at the bottom. So in the, in the Regreening Africa project, which is where we developed uh, the app initially, but we've now sort of expanded it beyond that, we see that we have a lot of engagement in Rwanda, a lot of use, Senegal, Ghana, Niger, Kenya. Um, and uh, at the, in the top left here, we have a map of Western Kenya. You can see the, where it is and the relative to the rest of Kenya. And we see polygons on this map where users have used the app to walk their field boundaries. And that's a really important aspect of this uh, is that we are actually tracking not only what people are reporting to be doing, but also where they are doing it. So the number of trees that are being planted or protected in the case of FMNR, how they're doing it, so what kinds of practices, where is this being done on farm, and for what. So it's, it's, it's really just a really rich data set that we're getting from this. If we zoom in just to look at an example, we see here uh, some, some of our stakeholders and partners on the ground measuring a tree. So essentially that tree is georeferenced. It sits within a field. Uh, you can see the field boundaries there on the map in the sort of greenish yellow. Um, and so in other words, we can, and we also capture the species and we do various measurements. So when people use the app, they're submitting information that ranges in that we can use to look at biodiversity, we can use it to look at the intensity of practices, we can figure out where they're happening, and we can look at change over time. So here's just an example from, from uh, Rwanda um, with some of the data. So you can see some of the species that are being planted. In the case of Rwanda, it's mostly tree planting. Um, and then the number of trees, the survival rates, which is, of course, a very important thing to keep track of and where on farm people are planting their trees. So is it on the boundary? Is it in a woodlot? Is it in cropland, et cetera? Uh, if we go to Senegal, just jumping across the continent, we see that mostly it's FMNR, so farmer managed natural regeneration. And these are the species on the left. And one of the things we see in, in, in these data sets is that in FMNR, we have a lot more diversity in terms of the trees than we see in tree planting. So that's a challenge that we're trying to address in a number of different projects around how do we bring in more diversity into these systems? So increasing biodiversity, which of course is important for soil and land health, 
uh, and it's also important in the context of agroecology. So you can see on the left again there a field boundary that one of the users has walked. So the key thing here now the, in the way that we use it, we're using this information is that with those field boundaries and with all that information that's being collected, we can connect the crowdsourcing to the science that we're doing. So in other words, we can take the field boundaries and combine that with assessments of land health, for example, soil carbon, which of course is a very important indicator of land health or soil health. And we can relate these things directly to, for example, climate neutrality goals, restoration targets, et cetera. And of course, this is very important in, in this decade of, of land restoration. And we can then extract these land health indicators for the boundaries that people are walking and then start looking at, at various scales. And I've just put a couple of uh, graphics on the map here that show distributions of erosion on, on the top one and soil organic carbon on the left one by country within the project. So we can then derive lots of insights into what is driving land degradation and we can we can design more effective restoration efforts uh, to, to sort of directly target um, target these challenges on the ground. So a, a very important it, uh, message. Are you finishing of, uh, off uh, top? Yes. So a very important thing here is the connection of the crowdsourcing or the citizen science and the science. Thank you, Fergus. Thank you, Tor. Wonderful. Uh, and just uh, to remind you, in, in the Q&A, you can vote for questions so that they go up to the top. Panelists will answer the questions as we're going on, um, but also uh, we will uh, uh, answer any that haven't been answered uh, after the uh, event and make it available to you. Let's move straight on to the Asian Farmers Association and Irish Bagala, who's going to uh, tell us about uh, the Forgotten Food Survey. Irish, you've got five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Fergus. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all from the Philippines. It is such a delight to be part of this huge multi-stakeholder and uh, timely initiative. So I am here uh, representing the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, or AFA, which has 20 member organization in 16 countries with around 13 million small scale women and men producers engaged in crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, birding, pastoralism. And uh, further, we collaborate with other uh, CSOs and other farmers organization in the region, reaching around 30 million farmers and additional 12 countries. So in the next few minutes, I will be sharing with you the process that we had undertaken for the farmer perception survey on traditional food crops, which is, uh, we believe a good example of what farmers organization can do and how uh, we can support these uh, Million Voices initiatives. So in the next um, three slides, you will see the partners that uh, we work with the, the perception survey is part of the collective action on forgotten food with GIFAR, Alliance, Bioversity, International, and SIAT, APAARI, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Crops for the Future, and FARA. So we have been given a small resource to be able to mobilize the national uh, partners and subnational uh, partners. So specifically for the survey, it was undertaken with uh, MS Swaminathan Research uh, Foundation based in India and with 25 national and subnational uh, partners. So you will see in the slides the, uh, the name of the national farmers organizations and CSOs that we worked with. So in the next slide, um, you can see that uh, we have uh, conducted these in um, prior to original, the next slide, please. Thank you. So we have conducted uh, this um, survey prior to our regional uh, webinar in June of this year. We used the survey result to develop a farmer's declaration on forgotten crops. We can uh, share that uh, with you in chat both the result and the farmer's declaration were presented during the regional consultation. Uh, it was deliberated and was uh, the basis to develop a regional uh, manifesto, both of the farmer's organization and uh, the, the research 
agencies, uh, specifically APAARI and all its uh, members. And in turn, this uh, regional joint regional manifesto was then used to craft or develop a global manifesto on forgotten food and um, it's being uh, used to guide the partners and the development of a, a global work plan based on this manifesto and the farmer's declaration uh, is underway. So the, the survey uh, was seen something that could facilitate the recognition of um, different stakeholders on the importance and value of indigenous species and knowledge of farmers and also seen as an effort to conserve and um, conserve these uh, indigenous uh, species. And it's also used to, to, to highlight or to identify the needed support of the communities to continue to conserve these uh, forgotten crops. So we, we see this, we see this uh, perception survey as a catalyst uh, to have uh, a discussion with various stakeholders. So uh, as I have said, it was uh, done prior to June, so March to May, uh, that was the duration. And there were 18 questions identified under four categories. One, uh, I think one of the lessons we've learned um, during the survey um, is on the type of questions as we had a challenge uh, processing uh, open-ended question given the number of uh, farmers that we were able to reach. So the next slide will show you the six step process that was involved in this um, initiative. So uh, a joint designing of the questions, translation, translating these questions into several languages of um, our national partners. And then we had an orientation with all our national partners, the Secretariat of National Farmers Federation, and then CSOs as well. And then we did the actual survey. Uh, they did it through phone interview and some of them did an online survey. So the national farmers encoded the data or the answers in the Google form uh, that we have created. And then the data were consolidated uh, via Google Sheet and some of the data uh, needed to be translated to, to English. Uh, following that, we had two consultation with our national partners, so all that in uh, a couple of months. So I already mentioned 19 countries were reached, majority of them are from India. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we were able to reach a total of 3,087 3, farmers um, in uh, 19 countries. Yeah, sorry, there's a delay in, in the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's the distribution. I have mentioned that majority of the uh, farmers who participated uh, were from India. So the next are slide. Coming, are, are you coming to the end? Uh, yes, I, yes. Uh, I think that's my, this is my last slide. Or, right. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, this is the farmer's declaration. I will not uh, go into detail, but uh, most of the, the survey result was reflected on this uh, declaration. So the next slide, um, we value this uh, process. We see this process as a very important to our partners because uh, it, it uh, it built our capacity at the regional and national level, and that um, it was not just you know data gathering, but it was also educational. And some of our farm, uh, partners are actually using it to engage um, their national government. So uh, we see uh, the same benefits uh, and maybe more in this Million Voice Initiative. And we see this as an opportunity to amplify our voice and our contribution. Uh, back to you, Fergus. Thank you so much, Irish. A lot to get into a short time. Uh, so let's move to a, a somewhat more structured approach to uh, interacting with farmers around uh, particularly breeding objectives. Um, and Jakob van Etten from the Alliance of uh, uh, Biodiversity and SEAT um, is going to tell us about exciting democratization of science in that area. Thank Sorry, you, please. Fergus. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Jakob Vetter, and I'll, I'll be talking about citizen science in agriculture experimentation. So uh, next slide, please. A lot of the work that we've done was mainly focused on um, uh, the testing of, of varieties. That includes land races, uh, modern varieties, varieties created with participatory breeding, for example, as well. Um, and many of these trials have common challenges. So logistics, 
large plots on uh, need large farms. So it's, it's difficult to work with smallholders, uh, collective action, bringing farms together to look at one plot. And then very often these observations that farmers then do are kind of snapshots because uh, it's not their farm, right? They, they need to go to the neighbor's farm to see it. And many of these trials are in a, in a way kind of a replicate of, or they try to imitate on station trials and that they want to be very precise. They're not always very representative of uh, farmer conditions. But next slide, please. So to address these challenges, we um, developed a citizen science approach uh, to, to address a number of these. So instead of uh, kind of looking at, uh, at farms and kind of paying for, for farms to, to be used for uh, participatory experiments, uh, we were very inspired by how citizen science allows um, farmers to, to really participate as, as citizen scientists themselves, right? That's, that's a principle in citizen science. Also that it requires less supervision, training, the digital support, the things that happen. So you've seen the, the presentation of Tor or the, the things that happen in bird observation, for example. Um, but it also needs kind of a rethink of the statistics uh, behind it. So that, that's uh, one area of work that we've done. But it also allows us then to analyze environmental adaptation. And it's very important for agroecology, this kind of uh, uh, place specific solutions. Next, please. So this is how the approach looks like. It's a little bit cut, uh, at least in my, sc uh, my screen, but it basically creates very small packages for each of the farmers. And those are then traced uh, digitally from start to finish. So you, you kind of design the experiment starting with a digital approach and all the data comes back to you from the farmers who, who do their observations to a single platform, which then allows you to, to draw conclusions and also to communicate these results back to farmers in a very quick way so that they stay engaged. And that is also a very important part of the approach. Next slide, please. Yes, so kind of the ingredients of this, so it's, it's about simplifying the approach, standardizing it, and that allows you then to digitally streamline it. And then you have all these kinds of benefits, so scaling, this ex what we call external validity. So the, it's representative of farmers' conditions themselves. Farmers grow really on their, how they would grow the crop. We can control the quality of the data. We know where the data comes from in terms of the GPS points and, and these kinds of things. And also this quick feedback that I already mentioned is really important, especially when you work with seeds, right? You don't want to miss a whole cycle, for example, because you're just, you're still analyzing the data. Next, please. So this is how it looks like in practice, a so very small fields. We've worked uh, with, with many crops uh, and also with um, consumption uh, testing. So you, what you see in the right down corner, uh, lower corner is uh, sweet potato testing in, in Uganda. Uh, people testing different varieties, but the, uh, the actual products. Next, please. But this is a little example of what, what you could do with this approach. So this is from Nicaragua. We, we, we uh, work with more than 800, uh, well, 800 uh, plots, uh, about 300 farmers who generated data. So we have GPS points on the left. We can then collect, uh, connect that with climate data, soil data, et cetera. And then on the right, what you see is the kind of uh, location specific variety recommendations that we then can generate from this. It also gives feedback to breeders who can take much better decisions about what farmers need, et cetera. Next, please. So in, in conclusion, what does it do? It, it, it streamlines, uh, on-farm testing and trials with, uh, with digital tools. We can involve farmers, but without overloading them, they do very small tasks each, but it kind of adds up. It has higher external validity and more insight in, in genotype by environment interaction. So there's space, uh, place specific uh, recommendations. It's not very difficult to do. And it also gives this sp scope to, um, involve different, uh, different organizations in doing it. So different uh, NGOs, uh, social enterprises, um, because it's easy and, and kind of scalable to do it. So we're also working on kind of new, what we call business models. Um, and, and so reconfiguring and scaling this also in, uh, in, in a different way than it used to be done. Next slide, please. Are you coming to the end? Yes, I, yes I this is the last slide, just uh, Overview of like the what we've done so far, 
and um, so it's it's growing. So that we, we've created this software, so people are now using it. We're supporting people to to use it more and more. And uh, I think that's the final slide, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, really uh, exciting, and and those numbers really beginning to uh, to add up now. Um, so let us move to the last of these sort of uh, highlight uh, presentations and uh, Krishnan Palasana, who's the country director for Digital Green in India, is, is going to tell us a bit about what he's doing and answer some of the questions uh, that are coming in the Q&A live. Over to you, Krishnan. You've got five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Digital Green is a, uh, our mission is to leverage the power of technology and the power of partnership to improve resilience, sustainable productivity, and income of smallholder farmers. Next slide, please. We are a not-for-profit located in uh, headquartered in San Francisco. We are working in East Africa and South Asia, and uh, uh, we have uh, reached out to close to uh, 3 million farmers and it's going day by day. Uh, we have trained 41,000 uh, frontline extension workers of the government. And uh, various studies have shown that our approach has primarily helped in adoption, uh, uh, increase, increase the adoption rate by 43%, improve the yield on an average by about 23% across various commodities. And most important, uh, some of those extension work that we do has uh, reduced the costs of extension by close to eight times. Next slide, please. Uh, there are three principles that we apply, and it's very important. Number one is that we listen very close to the farmers. So whatever we do, though we do use technology, it is for the farmers, and we typically co-design it with farmers. The second is that we don't create parallel systems. We work with the governments on ground because they are the ones who are going to be there to provide support, and they are the one who is going to scale up initiatives uh, 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 once an impactful practice is uh, adopted. And third, we collect data. We have data of nearly 3 million farmers, and we listen to that with data very carefully. And I will talk about that a little bit more later on. Next slide, please. Yeah, there are three transformational initiatives, and I will just focus on the first and third. The first one is the targeted digital advisories to inspire sustainable farm practice. The, uh, you know, we know that the adoption of agroecology and sustainable farm practices needs a behavior change and motivation among farmers. And we have come out with this video-based extension service that improves the efficiency and effectiveness of extension system. And this is typically by farmers or with farmers and for farmers. That is what is this uh, uh, advisory service is all about. The second, we have got uh, a number of products and services that we offer to farmers. The third one, we are also revisioning data itself, how uh, the data is being looked at at this point of time, and can we actually transform the way data is being uh, uh, looked up through a farmer-centric angle. Next slide, please. In the digital advisory service, we typically produce, we means that the community produce videos, they demonstrate those videos. It is the knowledge that we gain from the field itself. The community decides what videos or what are those issues that they want to cover through these videos. And instead of, you know, pamphlets, leaflets, and word of mouth communication. These videos are shown in the community through Pico projectors. And this, is, uh, and, and this has helped significant scale from starting from about 1,000 farmers about eight years ago. And we are reaching out to nearly uh, uh, 3 million farmers as of now. Close to 5,000 uh, videos are available uh, in, in YouTube library. And we have 67 million views as of now, uh, as, as I speak to you right now. And we have also come out with the complete training package uh, in, 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 in virtual facility, and more than 4,000 uh, frontline workers are, as of now, uh, enrolled in those virtual facilities. So this is one part of it, and this targeted advisories helps farmers to understand what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and, and it's almost like you know carrying a demonstration farm to their homes through those videos. Next slide, please. Uh, a number of products that I mentioned about Kisan Dairy, Kisan Dairy Enterprise, KD Dashboard, a MRV System, all these are direct to farmer oriented where uh, farmers can use these for various applications. Next slide, please. This is something that we are uh, initiated right now. It's called FarmStack. Now, uh, simply put, we know that many institutions, many agencies collect data. Everyone seems to be collecting data from farmers, from government onwards to private institutions. But the farmers doesn't even know that the biggest asset that they own is their own data, right? And unfortunately, 
these data sets, which is owned by different organizations, and they're very particular about uh, the, the ownership aspect, they don't speak to each other. So we were thinking about if these data sets can find a way to speak to each other without losing uh, the sovereign, uh, sovereignty or the control or the security aspects, we can actually provide value added service and support to the farmers. Uh, farmers. So we had a use case a couple of years ago, we continued it for uh, two, three other use cases. We were, we were able to successfully integrate or uh, bring together the weather data by a weather company, the soil data that is available with the government, the farmer's profile that we were having to send out targeted advisories to farmers in case of potato farming, in case of uh, cashew nuts farming, et cetera. And it became a uh, what we call as a blockbuster initiative in, in digital green. And then we further studied it and found that what we need is a protocol, a strong protocol that will help these independent data sets to speak to each other. So FarmStack is an open source community governed protocol in which we have set that protocol and we are offering that peer to peer uh, connectors. At the organizational level, this FarmStack helps them to create usage policies. Uh, the, the, the data owners can decide what to be shared, with whom to be shared, and uh, how long it to be shared. They can come up with those usage policies. And then we help them uh, to come out with this peer-to-peer -peer data connectors. Digital Green will not even see that data, what is being exchanged. It's all between those uh, data owners. And the most important part of it is related to farmers right now. Uh, how do we come out with a consent manager for farmers and, and ensure that the farmers are not only owning that data that they are having, they are controlling that data and they are giving consent to that data. And they are, all, are also able to discover what is that particular service that are being provided to them? And what is the value add that they will get because of this by sharing this data? So this is FarmStack and we, are, we have a number of use cases till now. Uh, we are excited about its possibilities and we are rolling out in a big way in, in the days to come. Next slide, please. Are, are you closing up now? Uh... Yes, yes, last slide. Say, for example, uh, this is one, you know, uh, you know, we do quality certification through a uh, uh, ad tech service provider. The quality certification is provided by the government. And this uh, data collection around quality helps us to send advisories, customized advisories to farmers. And also it helps to improve the market opportunities. But while all this were done, the farmers were being treated as simply mere recipients of the service. But once, what FarmStack does right now is it builds a consent mechanism into that. Farmer is going to own that data into their data wallet, and they will decide whom to share this data when to share this data and for what purpose they want to share this data. That is FarmStack. Next slide. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Chris. That's, uh, uh, again, uh, a huge lot of uh, uh, different uh, aspects that are um, really exciting ways of interacting. Do we have uh, the video teed up for the next contribution, which is uh, a critique uh, of big data? Um, Chris was already answering some of the issues that um, uh, are, are going to come up. So I'm expecting the video to start at any moment. Please keep the yeah, questions Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the invite and we apologize for not being able to participate in person. As we need to be very brief, I'll start right off with our presentation. In the first step, I will attempt to assess the digitization of agriculture from a rather critical stance and especially shed light on the role of what is called um, the platform economy. In the second part, uh, Anna will then argue for why we need alternative, that is uh, open source technologies and a commitment to uh, data sovereignty in the agricultural sector. Yeah, first of all, it's well known, many previously analog fields and farms are currently undergoing digital updates. Um, sensors, robots, drones, big data analysis and artificial intelligence are being employed for the purpose of precision farming in order to increase the overall efficiency of agriculture and optimize the use of fertilizers and pesticides in the fields. And the, um, here, uh, example or by Google X. Um, while there are many positive aspects to this development, um, there's also another yeah, more problematic side to it, namely that the more uh, network the farms and fields, the more dominant a production model coming uh, to us from our everyday life, the so-called platform economy, and taking this into account, the greater the influence of big tech. As Nick Cernick 
um, has argued the platform economy is the dominant economy of the digital present. It relies on a logic that has been developed and cultivated, especially by the leading tech companies of our age, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, Microsoft, called GAFAM. As such, a digital platform can hereby be defined as an intermediary infrastructure of exchange, a kind of quasi-market upon which products or services can be traded or conveyed in the same way as information and data. In this regard, many companies working in the field of precision agriculture have developed tools and apps that operate on platform economic principles. In other words, they, can, uh, they rely on data extraction, data analysis, and algorithm modeling, as well as platform economic structures and services established by big tech. As one example, um, the app FarmWave is designed as a knowledge platform using location and weather data for field reports and AI for image recognition. Its aim is to automatically uh, count the quantity of grown fruits for yield calculation or to digitally identify plants that have been infected by pests and other diseases. Yet the app relies on a fairly powerful superior platform economic infrastructure, which enables the database to be set up and processed in the first place, Google's cloud, which alongside Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure is one of the largest clouds uh, cloud platforms in this realm. FarmWave is uh, thus a tool which is fundamentally based on the services of Google Cloud and other products of the company. Um, for example, FarmWave recently experimented with the variable Google Glass to leverage AI and vision compute capabilities to inspect animals in their environment. Another app that can hardly run without the essential infrastructure of Google is Cottonase um, by the Indian Vidwani Institute um, for AI. And Google supports this app uh, through a $2 million uh, grant and its cloud services, which are used to help small farmers to identify um, the extent of pests or to predict disease trajectories. In addition, uh, this app offers a network of experts that can provide um, immediate advice. Cottonase uh, thus also serves as an information platform with the objective of reaching 2 million farmers by 2021. Um, these examples illustrate uh, a larger trend in smart farming. Google, Amazon, and the like are positioning themselves more and more as so-called meter platforms, providing essential infrastructure and expanding their influence in the agricultural sector as well. And so doing, the companies integrate smaller platforms, rent out their services and structures, and thus accumulate more and more data on farmer behaviors, production methods, and knowledge. The benefit is not only a constant inflow of profitable data, but also the emergence of a systemic dependency. As Christopher Miles uh, describes it, and I quote, uh, in order to actually receive the advantages and the value promised by precision equipment, you, means a farmer, must simultaneously share exquisitely uh, specific data about uh, your farm operations, data your labor generated for free. As a result, new services such as FarmWave or Cottonase, as well as, this, as the farmers um, themselves, can hardly use methods of precision agriculture without joining the ecosystem offered by meter platforms using their cloud services and even handing their personal data to them. On this ground, it is not difficult to predict a successive formation of monopoly power in the future, a formation in which a few corporations act less as producers than as hegemonic or as proprietary markets. As such, using hardware, software, and server infrastructures, uh, they could form an overarching ecosystem that operates as a wallet garden with several lock-in effects. This concentration of power is problematic, not least because a marketplace owned by a single company enables that company to set standards define codes of conduct, control the barriers to market entry, and that is why it can more or less dictate who will be able to act on that market when and under what conditions. And I will now expand on this aspect. Thank you very much.
So in our view, it is likely that the collection of data will lead to an even greater competitive advantage that will further strengthen monopoly power. And what is also likely is that it will enable the creation of proprietary forms of knowledge, which is an equally problematic point. Just to give you a brief example in this regard, based on the incoming data from its cloud service and AI image recognition services, Google will first know everything about the behavior of farmers, and second, it will also know which pesticide is needed to what extent, plus it will be able to diagnose specific pests and diseases based on the extent of their data. And this much needed knowledge will be private and accessible only to those who are willing to pay for it. And in addition, this knowledge can then be used by big tech to develop their own services and products, or even be sold to agricultural insurance companies who might, of course, have an interest in assessing individual risk profiles. So the questions we should ask then are first whether such knowledge resulting from what Shoshana Zuboff terms data extractivism should lie in the hands of a few tech monopolies, and second, which forms of epistemic dependency might follow from this. And it is also vital to think about justice-related issues, of course, and ask, for instance, who really benefits from these services in the end. Um, and there's further issues that are at stake that I can only briefly mention, um, including privacy issues, the ecological implications of expanded digitized infrastructures, problems relating to the automation of physical and mental labor, algorithmic biases, um, and so on. In recent years, it has become increasingly clear that um, as soon as GAFA managed to implement their own data infrastructure on a global scale, the harder it is to regulate them. And moreover, the difficult it will be to develop alternative infrastructures that go beyond proprietary markets and their common framework of data extractivism. So regulation, of course, is an equally important issue. It is no coincidence that GAFA has established cooperative relationships with states and institutions alike, and it has done so much to their own benefit. For instance, in the health and education sectors on the context of so-called smart cities, where public infrastructure is often provided by tech monopolists, the data that is generated is usually privatized. So here, more effective regulation uh, and a much more critical stance toward the tech sector and its narratives will be needed. And that also holds, of course, for the increasingly digital agricultural sector and agricultural policy. So to conclude then data, and by that I specifically mean big data, is not reducible to a neutral and a priori positive or a natural process or development. Rather, as Melvin Kranzberg pointed out decades ago, technology is neither bad nor good, nor is it neutral. And in this regard, data and platforms are especially in the age of uh, surveillance capitalism or platform capitalism, inextricably tied to commercial interest, uh, the dynamics and consequences of which need to be taken into account when discussing the expansion of the digital transformation into new realms that holds, of course, as well for agriculture and food production. So in our view, it is probable that so-called big tech, uh, specifically including leading tech monopolies such as Google, aka Alphabet, Felix pointed to it, will use opportunities such as smart farming uh, to extend their own power and create platform-related dependencies and we've also observed how GAFM have expanded what we call infrastructure power, that is a form of power that circumvents um, political deliberation uh, or regulation with the aim of establishing a new universal standard or a new norm. Um, Shoshana Zuboff has referred to what she calls institutional effects as the outcome of new practices of data extractivism that are implemented when no effective instruments or regulation are available. Um, as political scientist Will Davies describes the logic of platformization in relation to GAFAM, and I quote, um, the ultimate objective of internet companies is to provide the infrastructure through which humans encounter the world. Uh, when we want to be somewhere else, we click on Uber, and when we simply want something, Amazon will make it arrive, end of quote. Uh, one could follow this rather dystopian outlook and proclaim with regard to the digitization of agriculture, when a farmer wants to work effectively in the future, he or she might need to work with Google Cloud Services, with Amazon Web Services, and so on, so in short, he or she will depend on a monopolized tech infrastructure to be able to compete at all. So although much of new digital products in the realm of agriculture are advertised following a narrative of empowerment and a language of sharing of commonality of transparency and democracy, our focus should instead be on critically assessing the potential reproduction of inequalities, hierarchies, and forms of injustice in the sector. So last but not least, and this is my last point, in order to democratically benefit uh, from the digitization of agriculture, we need da data alternatives. Uh, and by that, I mean, we need open source technologies and a fundamental commitment to collective data sovereignty, where not only data, but also forms of knowledge generated by data are accessible without any restriction. 
And on that note, I thank you very much. And again, sorry that we were unable to attend this meeting in person, but we are more than happy to respond to any questions or comments from your side. Here's our email address, so feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. So uh, that, that's uh, a very challenging perspective for us and, and a number of things we need to uh, keep in mind. I'd now like to ask uh, Yodit uh, Kebedi from uh, IRD um, to try to sum up a little bit what the key issues are that have come from both the highlights and, and that critique. Yodit, you have five minutes. Agus, thank you very much for giving me uh, this opportunity. So this last presentation actually raises the very issues uh, that agroecological approaches proponent uh, criticized. Uh, concentration of uh, power in the in food sector, the, the control over uh, knowledge generated by farmers, the increased also dependency of uh, producers on, on few uh, technologies. But this data extraction uh, approach, which has been really advanced, uh, been advancing in, uh, recently due to more use of mobile phones and increased uh, uh, precision farming approach digitalization, uh, is, has been expanded and uh, also risk to expand further uh, in the future. But even like in addition to this more uh, to this uh, data extraction uh, uh, through this um, more modern uh, solution, even like traditional uh, classical research approach has actually been in a bit uh, data uh, extraction approach without considering uh, bringing this knowledge uh, back to the end users. And that is actually at the earth of what agroecology uh, want to change. So to address this uh, existing power dynamics, which uh, have led farmers in increased uh, dependency on, on fuel technologies, which has also reduced uh, citizen uh, choices uh, for their food and also uh, reduced their inclusion in decision making uh, in the food systems. But it also has um, limited the resources for researchers to work on alternative uh, farming approaches to conventional farming. So citizen science can uh, have can be actually used in a different way, as we saw uh, during uh, these presentations. Uh, in some cases, uh, it is just a crowdsourcing approach where citizens are just sensors and sending uh, data and they volunteer in computing the data that they, um, that they gather in their, uh, in their local uh, context. Uh, in some situations, uh, they are um, uh, already um, included in the basic interpretation of this data and uh, they are also are included in thinking on this, on this data. Um, there are then more uh, inclusive, inclusive approaches to citizens and science, where uh, when we have more participatory science, uh, when the citizens or the farmers are uh, participating in the, in the problem definition and, uh, and, and the data collection. And then more uh, when we go more in the collaborative science, uh, then farmers and citizens are really included in the problem definition, in data collection, and in the analysis. So agroecology actually promotes those more um, inclusive forms of citizen science, so participatory science and even more like collaborative science, where there is a mutual learning and, and co-sharing of knowledge, and where scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge and an intimate understanding of ecosystem are actually brought together to tackle the tangled um, issues related to agriculture, to environment, to nutrition, and to climate. We know that agroecology is knowledge intensive and that requires specific data to, to local context and to, to be able to co-design relevant and adaptive solution for those uh, local context. And that kind of require a lot of resources. So citizen science, collaborative and inclusive citizen science can be really a way to um, approach this uh, knowledge intensive uh, aspect of agroecology. And as we know also some issues uh, like um, climate issues are, um, cannot be resolved. Um, they, they need um, a global perspective while actually depending on local data. 
And also many other uh, natural and ecological processes, they actually also require this approach, having the global perspective, but also uh, relying on this uh, local, um, local data. So that is how actually um, this uh, citizen, citizen science, which is uh, not only uh, being in a um, data extraction approach, but really um, uh, being inclusive and collaborative can actually allow us to address the uh, multiple issues that uh, are entangled and unpredictable also issues which are related to agriculture, to environment, to nutrition and climate. So I um, just want to conclude that this uh, citizen science uh, can indeed be, uh, can support and can be necessary for agroecology, but only when a more decentralized approach uh, is taken and when the data which is collected is uh, transformed and used as a public uh, uh, tool for knowledge uh, sharing and knowledge generating. Fantastic, Edith, that you've got a lot of key points in there and crystallized things really well. Uh, now we're running 10 minutes late. Um, so we're gonna, uh, I hope that uh, uh, a lot of you can stay on because it's now getting interactive and uh, we're doing a little bit of citizen science and I'm handing over now to Mika Bourne um, from Shared, um, who is going to take us through uh, a little bit of interactive uh, uh, participation, Mika. Thank you so much, Fergus. And as you've mentioned, we've heard uh, a rapid view through, through different options and a critique. So now we would really like to hear some feedback. Many of you are probably very familiar with Slido, but if you are not, please go to slido.com. And then where it asks for the code at the top, you put in million voices. The other alternative is to use the QR code that you can now see on the screen. So I'll just give you a moment to get to slido.com and then I'm going to launch the first poll. So coming back to what Fergus outlined at the beginning of the session, there's different elements of citizen science, but in your view, what is most important? Citizens doing the science and collecting the data or, or that citizens' concerns and needs are being considered by the science. And I can see results coming in. So we have a rising number feeling that citizens doing the science and collecting the data is critical. And now almost being overtaken by citizens' concerns and needs being considered by scientists. So very quite, really quite even. So we're going to give it a few moments to see which one will take over. It looks like citizen uh, concerns and needs being considered by the scientists has, is slightly in the lead. So now we're going to run to the next question. And this is a word cloud. Um, so just put in one or two question uh, responses or words in response to the question, what aspects of agroecology do you think citizen science can address? So just one word or two words and it can be very broad. So the, the different elements of agroecology, where do you think citizen science will be very helpful in addressing? And we can see quite a variety coming in around co-creation, power inequality, co-creation, obviously getting uh, a number of different views, but a really wide number of topics with, with this idea of co-creation in the center. So we want to give people a few more moments. Soil and diversity, also very key topics for agroecology and the role of citizen science. Just giving a few more moments for other ideas to come in. And it's wonderful to see co-creation at the, at the center, as well as having these other topics and elements around that. So soil, complexity, diversity, and co-creation. And I'm going to rush us through a little bit because we are running out of time and we don't want to take uh, you past the hour too much. So just giving a few more moments for other additions. Agroforestry coming in now, policy, power inequality, wonderful. 
I'm now launching the very last question, and this is quite open ended, so we can leave this one running as we pass back to Fergus to wrap up. And we've seen this also in the chat and the Q&A, but what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see with citizen science? We've heard a critique of the big data. We've seen some different options. I've seen some comments in the chat around um, the accessibility, the data, the, the network access, and we can see ideas coming in here. You can write a long sentence or a short one. Um, ideas around making it incentivized for people to share data. Accessibility is coming up, both of access to input the data and also to see the results. Those that are non-tech savvy, the inclusiveness and the ownership. And we can see a really useful amount of information coming in now. And the group would really like to use these comments, these suggestions, also what has come up in the Q&A to really inform the direction, the priorities of this initiative as it moves forward, the Million Voices Initiative. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but please continue adding in to this question as I pass back to Fergus to sum up. And thank you all very much for your contributions. Super, thank you so much, Mika. You did that in um, uh, uh, rapid time. So it's, we're just actually on the hour um, uh, at five. Um, and uh, what I want to stress at this point is that uh, at the moment we've got an 18 month uh, time frame. So this is just uh, the beginning. Um, uh, but it's quite important that in a, um, uh, a a side event at UNFSS, we've actually started uh, this engagement. So trying to get bottom up so that we have that paternoster principle of working bottom up and top down at the same time to try to meet uh, global objectives in locally relevant ways. So what we envisage happening uh, after this is a series of more uh, um, focused events at national and regional levels where we'll explore in a little bit more detail what questions we can uh, answer and address, not just at the farming aspects of agroecology, but also at the, the consumption side and, and, and everything that, that makes up uh, the food system. So I'd really like to thank everybody for uh, taking part. I think we had over 130 people online um, um, at the peak, um, over 20 questions. We will uh, make sure all the questions are answered one way or another. Please look out for further communication, continue to be involved, use the resources that will be available uh, uh, on the web, take part in, in, in the discussions um, on uh, the TPP website where you'll be able to interact uh, with this initiative as it develops. And uh, 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 we can see that Digital Green are already reaching 3 million farmers. So it shouldn't be that difficult for us to be um, uh, tackling citizen science issues uh, with at least a million voices within the 18 month period that we've set ourselves to get moving and to deliver some results from this initiative. So with that, I'd like to thank you all um, and close this event. Thank you.